When jarred unavoidably by circumstance, revert at once to yourself, and don't lose the rhythm more than you can help. You'll have a better grasp of harmony if you keep going back to it. Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius To say that the last two weeks have been difficult for law enforcement is to understate the events of the past 14 days. Nine officers killed, assassinated, in eight days. In addition, a Chicago PD officer who referred to be beat to nearly to death, then risked being subjected to the public ridicule and Monday morning quarterbacking. To say that this is the hardest time in American history to be a police officer is not unrealistic. But what are we going to do? I know you took an oath. I took an oath. The greatest privilege of my life is not the badge on my chest and not the gun on my hip. The greatest privilege of my life is working shoulder to shoulder next to people who believe in a higher calling, a higher purpose. We, the cops, the dispatchers, the probation officers, the corrections officers, we, we keep the evil at bay. We keep it locked away. Millions of people sleep peacefully because of our efforts. Millions of children will never be victimized because we're there to protect them. Millions of people every day retain their liberty, their pursuit of happiness, their life because of us. Stay strong. Please. Please stay strong. Know that you are gifted with being part of something bigger than yourself, bigger than anything else on earth. You are gifted with a chance to be part of the high ground, part of the solution, standing on the right side of good versus evil. Stay strong. Please. Please stay strong. We need you. My family needs you. My kids need you. This country needs men and women like you willing to answer the call, willing to forgo fame and fortune and instead abdicate your own well-being for your fellow citizens. This country needs more citizens, but we really need citizen warriors. That's you. Please, stay in the fight. Take the high road. Serve with honor and courage and sacrifice. And don't ask for anything in return. Because you are not God's gift to democracy, but you are a gift to God. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 45 of The Squad Room. I'm your host, Garrett Teslaw. I'm an active duty patrol sergeant in Southern California. Thanks for joining us. This Squad Room is about optimizing, maintaining, and developing our best health and fitness and wellness for law enforcement officers all around the world. And we are all around the world at this point. I think uh, 68-something countries uh, and downloads keep coming in. So thank you very much for listening. If you've been with us for a long time, if this is your first time, this is a good one. Uh, and it may be bringing people in who haven't heard before. Our guest today is John Wellborn, former NFL uh, player and uh, founder of Power Athlete HQ and CrossFit Football. So we have a good conversation with him coming up, uh, and we'll get to it shortly. Before we jump into him, I want to thank our sponsors for the show, Audible.com, uh, the, the, basically the original audiobook founder creators out there, uh, connected to Amazon. If you have an Amazon Prime account, Audible is easy to use. It's easy to use either way, but uh, I like Audible because for uh, those of us who drive around, spend a lot of time in our cars, if you're done with your podcasts, if you've hit the end of the internet with the podcasts, and you've listened to, of course, my back catalog, audiobooks are a great way to keep your mind going, your your uh, brain thinking and functioning, learning new things, rather than just listening to AM radio or the same top 40 over and over again. So the Squad Room is offering, or Audible is offering the Squad Room listeners a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook, no strings attached, 
uh, just to try it out, audibletrial.com forward slash the squad room, and you'll get a free audiobook of your choice and a 30 day trial. And uh, you can continue it from there, you can cancel it from there, whatever you want to do. My uh, recommendation for this episode is uh, Resilience by Eric Greitens, uh, currently running for Governor of Missouri right now, but a former Navy SEAL, uh, Rhodes Scholar. His first book, The Heart and the Fist, that's another great, amazing book. That book changed my idea of policing in general, and it's not even about policing. But uh, that, that'd be my audible recommendation for this week is uh, Resilience by Eric Greitens. And uh, audibletrial.com forward slash the squad room for your free 30 days. All right, so John Wellborn. John's a nine-year veteran of the NFL. He played for the Chiefs. He's played for the Eagles and for the Patriots. He was drafted in 1999. Uh, after uh, coming out of University of California, Berkeley. And this is something I didn't ask him about, but I thought was curious because, uh, you know, Berkeley is not um, a schlub school at all. And on top of that, he graduated with a degree in rhetoric, which, uh, is, you know, it's a philosophy degree. And uh, I, that struck me as interesting compared to the often communications or something like it you see on the on the Sunday football scrolls when they give someone where they what school they came from it's like you know often it's like communications or physical education or maybe it's marketing or something like that but rhetoric I don't think I've ever seen that one anyway John did over started over 100 careers during his 10-year career or nine-year career in the NFL 10 playoff appearances um, uh, he's got a, a an interesting background he also founded CrossFit football and he competed in the 2008 CrossFit Games uh, down at the ranch uh, 2008. That's also the year that James Fitzgerald uh, won. James is a former uh, guest on the show, creator of OPEX Fitness. And we actually talk about James uh, and uh, some comparisons of their two programs uh, coming up during the show. John now he runs Power Athlete HQ. You can check out more about him and what he does and his programs at Power PowerAthleteHQ.com. He's got a lot of different programs. The reason I got turned on to John, I knew about John, uh, but didn't necessarily think of him as a guest until Freddie Camacho, friend of the show, former guest, Union City PD sergeant, uh, hit me up and was like, dude, you got to talk to this guy. Um, Freddie had recently started his new one of his newer programs, Grindstone, which is one of John's programs for um, it's a, a workout plan for people who need some flexibility and some uh some uh, yeah some flexibility in their workouts. Anyway, Freddie just started that program, but has known John for a long time. He's like, you got to get him on. John's a reserve used to be a reserve police officer on top of his NFL career, and he's a big fan of uh, hunting and shooting guns and all those sorts of things. Anyway, that a lot of us are, so he's a- easy to connect with. And sure enough, uh, we got on the phone. John spends a lot of time training people in Major League Baseball, NHL, NFL, cro- top level CrossFit people. He does a lot with Naval Special Warfare. The SEALs, he does a lot of uh, law enforcement training, and he knows, as you'll hear in this interview, he knows a lot about uh, what our stressors are like, what our job's like. He tells a great story about going in foot pursuit and tackling an arson suspect, and I can't imagine what it was like to get tackled by John, who I think is six foot eight and a, a lean 270 pounds. Um, that must have been a shock to that poor arson system. It's poor, but you know what I mean. Anyway, uh, John was kind enough, too. He's got a book out, an e-book out. Um, called Talk to Me Johnny, uh, which was the name of his blog. And he's offering 20% discount to Squadron listeners. If you go to powerathletehq.com, go to the store, and you can uh, find the book there. If you enter the promo code SQUAD, all in caps, S-Q-U-A-D, all in caps, you get 20% off. And uh, John was kind enough to offer that too. It's a lot of his writings on training and uh, his philosophy on the mindset of training and everything else like that, which we get to in the show. It's a great episode. And John was kind enough to spend a lot of time with us and give us a lot of his time, a lot of his insight. And uh, I think you'll enjoy this episode with John Wellborn. John Wellborn, thanks uh, for being on the show. Welcome to the Squad Room. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, we have a mutual friend in Freddie Camacho, uh, who has uh, recently uh, gone to your programming and um, Freddie and I have, uh, Freddie's a guest of the show in the past, a friend of the show. Uh, what we have in common, of course, is that we're both in law enforcement. And I wanted to talk to you because I think you, with your history, um, have um, probably some very unique perspectives on the demands and the requirements of building strength, but also like a whole body strength for, for us, right? So I want to start with a question on... Um, on being a tactical athlete. And I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before, but it's one that, that we use a lot in the profession, but also on this podcast. 
And the idea is that we, as law enforcement officers, need to treat ourselves as athletes, right? I mean, we the, the, the closest um, analogy that we usually give is like a boxer in a ring or a, or a UFC fighter. Like uh, Tim Kennedy was a guest on a recent episode, right? And he's going to be he's going to be uh, fighting at UFC 205 at Madison Square Garden. So you know, Tim knows in the in the context of MMA or boxing, he knows who his opponent's going to be. He knows his strengths and weaknesses. He knows who <laughs> his training partners are going to be and what his training is going to look like going up to it. He knows what time that fight is at and he knows where it's at. And the disadvantage, of course, for us in the tactical athlete realm is that we don't have any of those benefits right we have to be prepared at all times in order to be prepared for the worst time so i wanted to ask about in the context of us as law enforcement officers treating ourselves as athletes what are your what do you think are the priorities that we need to be focusing on first um well i mean the biggest one uh, that at least i've seen in the law enforcement community is uh is health and longevity um i rarely worked with a community that was in worst physical or more importantly meant uh, medical shape than law enforcement. I mean, unfortunately as a job, you guys sit and wait a lot. And as anybody knows, sitting too much is akin to smoking two packs of cigarettes. Um, I remember one of the first uh, LEO gigs I did, uh, just doing a basic eval of the people, you know, hey, what's on here? Uh, you know, give me a, you know, health understanding, you know, medications, different things. And the amount of prescription drugs that the guys were on that I was teaching for was kind of astounding. Uh, you know, I think the lowest was zero and the highest was six and a lot of guys were out of shape and it just becomes the, uh, you know, the job. I mean, a lot of guys work night shifts and we know that people that tend to work nights tend to be in worse physical shape just because, you know, they come home, they want to sleep, maybe they don't get their workouts in, they're not as, um, you know, uh, ready and able to do what they need to do in terms of training to really prepare themselves. Um, so, uh, my biggest thing is just making sure people are healthy, making sure you're sleeping enough, making sure that you are not on a myriad of drugs that are prescribed at just, you know, haphazardly trying to, you know, clean that up. Uh, fix the diet. Uh, that was another big one I saw with guys, um, you know, not doing anything in terms of meal prep. So, if, hey, if they're out on a shift, it's easy just to pull in at this place and get this donut or get this or this or, you know, different things. And since you're really driving around uh, a lot of times or on calls, it's really kind of hard to eat. So <clears throat> giving guys a strategy for how to really address their meals and to not just take the easy way out and swing in. So sleep, uh, looking at what drugs they were trying to, um, a lot of the guys were overweight and not really prepared for the demands of their job. And, you know, you made a great point where you said tactical athletes, perfect. Uh, you know, our definition of athleticism is a little unique to power athlete and what we do in that it's the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns through space to accomplish a known, a known or novel task. And for you guys, we really kind of, um, we kind of can understand the demands if we train for the worst demand. Uh, you know, one, you guys got to be proficient with shooting, shooting 50 rounds a year for your qual is not really training to be proficient with your weapon. God help you if that you actually have to draw and use your weapon and, you, and you're not skilled enough. So I find a lot of guys, uh, do they shoot enough? Are they training? Do they do enough dry firing? Do they do enough tight movements to be, basically be able to just you know, use their pistol? And then if that pistol gets taken away from you, what's next? Am I able to fight with my hands? Is it, am I able to use a club? Do I have a backup? What does it look like? And then putting guys in a situation where they do that. How many guys actively are training for that situation or is it just easier to go home? So I think in terms of that tactical athlete, it's great. Um, by really looking at it and, and creating some worst case scenarios, I think you can effectively start creating a training platform that really uh, is beneficial to you guys. And, and um, the biggest thing with law enforcement and the one thing that I really respected with a lot of the guys is I asked them like, you know, what's the big takeaway from this at the end of the day, what's the one thing? And every guy said, Hey, I want to come home alive. I want to go home to my family. I want to finish my shift with all the pieces. I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want my buddies to die. And like, to me, when you start taking your fitness past the idea of like, Hey, I want to go work at, you know, train at this local throwdown, or I want to, you know, train in a bodybuilding contest, or even like I did go play football. When you start taking that from these novel events, like, I want to be able to do 21, 15, 9 at some local throwdown opposed from now I have to go out on the street and I might have to use my fitness to not only save my life but also save my buddy's life. That's when shit becomes real and all of a sudden this thing becomes, uh, you know, very serious and a great sense of urgency. And then, you know, being able to convey that to guys and being like, you guys are doing a dangerous job. And that job is no more dangerous at any other point that I've seen in my life than it is today. 
Well, so, um, so true there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, uh, one of the girls that worked for me, which still works for us, uh, you know, taught for the CrossFit football seminar and worked on power athletes. She moved up to Seattle, and now she's a police officer. She got approached to go to the academy. And I remember she called me, and I said, uh, she asked me what I thought, and I'm like, I think you're crazy. You're going to go be, uh, you're literally going to go be a cop in an urban environment like Seattle. Uh, as a female officer, I like, uh, I, I don't know whether to congratulate you or tell you to run. Uh, I mean, <laughs> this is a, a situation where, you know, law enforcement, at least in my life, uh, growing up, you know, even though, uh, you know, uh, you know, my run-ins with the police were more kind of traffic related or just being a dipshit kid growing up. But I mean, there was always a, a, a sense of respect for the guys doing the job, you know, like here they are, you know, as supposed peacekeepers out there trying to do this thing. And you know what? And, you know, that always deserved a little bit of respect and a little bit of fear. And it seems as if that is all kind of melted away. I mean, there was a, a deal. Somebody posted a video of uh, some CHP guy up in here in Central California tried to pull over for these guys street racing. And a mob of like 50 people attacked his car. You know, like it's amazing that there isn't the respect for law enforcement. And I don't know if it's really law enforcement or just people just don't respect shit anymore. Um, and I, you know, and that's a social commentary. So with that being said, the situation that you guys are going to be in, uh, going forward is going to be extremely dire. And I think when you take a look at that, the training has to be brutal. The training has to be represent or, uh, representative of what you guys potentially could see in the street. So going into the gym and, you know, maybe hitting a little back and buys, riding the bike for 20 minutes, doing the lat stretch and getting out doesn't suffice anymore. And I think, you know, you hit it on the head where you said, you know, now it has to be not only are you a strong, uh, you know, fast, explosive athlete that can move and, you know, is doing a bunch of different things that's not only proficient with their weapon, but is also proficient with their hands and proficient with other things. I mean, you might get into a situation where your gun's gone, you got no stick, you might have a broken hand and you might have to pick up something and use it as a weapon to defend yourself. And, you know, have you trained to effectively do these things? And, um, that's the one thing, I mean, you know, whether it be Krav Maga or MMA or Jiu Jitsu, I mean, I think any law enforcement guy, uh, I come from a boxing background and, um, even though I love watching MMA, I'm always been a boxing fan. And for those of you guys that have ever seen what somebody that's actually a professional or skilled or even an amateur boxer can do to a normal person, it's fucking just unbelievable. I, I was in a bar once and a guy who was an amateur boxer got into a uh, scrap with a dude and this guy hit this guy like 25 times in the face before the dude even knew what was what, what happened to him. Right. And, uh, but like that ability to use your hands and then, you know, to be comfortable in terms of taking blows and being hit. And it's like, you know, it's like preparation to be the ability to go into that situation and not be nervous, not lose your cool. And, um, I think a lot of the problems, um, uh, affecting law enforcement today really come from a lack of training. Uh, you know, tax dollars get cut, programs get cut, training get cut. It seems like we're asking our law enforcement guys to do more with less preparation than they've ever had. Uh, if it was me and um, I was funding a, you know, a, a city and we needed a naval police force, uh, training would be mandatory. And, you know, I mean, you know, the problem with that, too, is you guys got unions and you got a lot of other stuff on the other side. And you got other people that, uh, you know, probably shouldn't be doing the job. Um, I'm sure you guys, you, you've run into that, too. You run into a lot of law enforcement guys that are doing it because they think, hey, this was a good job, this is a good opportunity, and you're like, you might not have the best temperament for this. Yeah. and uh, or, or you don't want to go to the gym and bust your ass to be basically be prepared. And I think for a guy like you and a guy like Freddie and some of the other people that take their job very seriously, take their fitness very seriously, and take, like, you know, take this stuff seriously, that's got to be frustrating. So, I mean, but that's the joys of in a you know, public government type job where you know, people tend to accept a little bit of everybody, and they probably shouldn't for this job. Yeah. Well, I think I mean, the, a lot of the show, the intent of the show is, you know, there's there's a possibility that you take yourself and your fitness seriously and the job seriously. But, you know, factors within your control and without and outside of your control start to have their effect. And over the course of 5, 10, 15 years, you've added a couple of uh, inches to your Sam Brown gun belt. And, you know, and, and your your sleep is no longer ideal and kids enter the picture and. And so how do you how do you recover from that is a, is a big exploration of the show. Like how do how do you get grounded again and then move on? So I wanted to ask you a follow up. You mentioned about like, you know, your your training should be stressful. Some some recent guests, uh, James Fitzgerald of OPEX was on the show sure. and his take was unique to something I'd never heard. Because I I train 
my training typically is pretty hardcore in, in the sense of like I, I'm trying to induce a little stress. I'm trying the mental aspect of it, the, 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 the not quitting aspect is what I love about CrossFit is that it's a very, as much a mental game as it is a physical game. But his argument was that um, in a job where you're already so stressed out, stressing out the body during workouts may not be the best approach. And you may be um, inducing excessive amounts of cortisol and, and those stress hormones into your body that then actually deteriorate your muscle. But, I mean, you work with stressed out people all the time. You've worked with the SEALs. What, what's your opinion on that? Or maybe, maybe you've already answered it. But can you clarify that a little bit? Uh, you know what? Like, um, I, I I can see James' side of the argument. If you take a guy who uh, has really poor sleep, he's got three kids, you know, an ex-wife and a soon-to-be ex-wife and a stressful <laughs> job and a bad diet and he's overweight, and you add all these extraneous factors in. You're clearly no probably, cops, by the way. What's that? <laughs> you just described a lot of cops there with two ex-wives. Well, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, if you, I'm sure Freddie told you this, but uh, um, not only have I worked a lot with the LEO community and, you know, uh, the military and, you know, MARSOC and, you know, Naval Special Warfare, but I actually was a reserve officer with the program uh, for a number of years. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting when you start, you know, talking to a bunch of different guys and everybody has a similar story. And I mean, it's like, you know, like, uh, you know, hanging out with the guys from Naval Special Warfare and, you know, hearing them talk about drinking alcohol or, you know, their different alcohol related stories. It's like you're going to get them. Um, but I, I can see James's uh, point of view in that if you take all these external factors that are causing stress, the last thing you want to do is maybe put them in an extremely stressful situation and, you know, stress them out even more. Um, but. On the other hand, uh, I would not want somebody to be on the street and be in a potentially stressful situation that their only stressful situation that day was dealing with a screaming ex-wife. Right. You know, I, I think um, the one thing which I've kind of learned is that uh, as you get married and you have kids and a job and all these other factors, you need some outlet, you need some release, you need somewhere to put it. Uh, for us, it's getting in the morning and banging weights and training and, you know, trying to, trying to rev it up a little bit. Now, um, is it always going to look the same? Is it always going to have this red line intensity? No, uh, I have a six month old little boy and he woke up at two thirty, three thirty, four thirty, and five fifteen, And so I was up pretty much the whole night. So we came in to train here at six and we sat here and had a little bit of coffee and at six thirty we went in and we just basically just moved for 30 or 40 minutes. Um, it looked like, uh, you know, goblet squats, push ups, uh, aerodyne, uh, you know, a bunch of trunk stuff, med ball. I mean, we just moved. I mean, it, it really wasn't the day to go in and fucking kick the tires, light the fires and burn the house down. But we got something in and we got moved because, you know, that's what you have to do. Um, you know, you gotta, you know, try to keep back the hands of time. Um, but, uh, you know, I think for you guys, the training has to be, and I hate using the word mixed modal, but it, it really has to be. Uh, you know, if it was just pure CrossFit where you guys are in here and it's 2159 AMRAPs and, you know, you look like a standard CrossFit template, I think you guys are leaving a lot on the table. And I really don't recommend that pure type thing for, for you guys. Uh, if I was going to periodize, and I've done this for law enforcement guys, they would probably have maybe something that looked like two to three Metcons a week. They'd probably have two strength days and two dedicated fight days. And even if that fight day is just speed bag and hit the mitts and hit a heavy bag for 20 or 30 minutes, that type of movement where they're just using their hands and reinforcing and then, you know, technique days and uh, just a lot of mobility type stuff. And I, I hate the term mobility and I hate the term flexibility um, just because it's been beat to, beat to the ground so bad. But what I like to call is trunk stability. You guys sit so much in this bad position. And then, unfortunately, like you said, your gun belts are usually heavy. That was something that we worked a lot with a lot of guys is uh, they had way too much shit on their belt. I'm like, how is it the older or even hopefully <laughs> the, as guys get older, they just accumulate more shit on their belt. I'm like, do you really need three sets of handcuffs? That taser you have weighs 18 pounds. And I remember like working with some guys and being like, God, my back is fucking hurting me. I'm like, dude, look how much shit you have on your belt. You can't even get out of your car. You know, the one thing I learned from training with the guys from Naval Special Warfare is, you know, ounces equal pounds and the, the ability to move fast and basically be agile is more important that, you know, if, if uh, you know, carrying three mags it allows you to move faster than carrying five mags and you carry three mags. And I think for the law enforcement guys, that's something too. Like, um, 
one of my favorites was uh, one of the first times I went out on patrol. We had to hawk this dude, and I was wearing a uh, uh, a pistol rig on my leg, like a leg rig. Mm-hmm. And as I literally took off to get this guy, you know, good sprint technique, punch and hammer, I split the top of my hand open uh, on the gun. So as like as I went to swing the hand through, the the pistol was kind of low on my leg. Yeah. And I literally split the back of my hand open. It was a SIG with a metal mag, and I split the top of my hand open. And as I'm running, my gun is flopping around. And this thing's fucking killing me. And there was no way I could keep striving. So literally, I got back after I, like, you know, the dude was obviously not that fast for the first 20 feet. So I got him. And uh tackled this guy. And uh, the dude was like, that was pretty good. I'm like, well, yeah, fuck, I split my hand open and this gun was sucked. So he's like, what are you going to do? I'm like, well, I'm getting rid of this fucking gun off my leg. And I'm only going to shoot a Glock because it's made of plastic. No more metal. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, that type of real world shit that you figure out. But how many guys have ever been into a situation where they go in the gym? I got my pistol rig on. And uh, let's tussle. Let's get in a fight. Let's see what it looks like. You know, that was something, too, especially when I trained with the guys from Naval Special War for the ability to work with your plate carrier, the ability to do different movements in your full gear and then start kind of ferreting out and seeing what works and what doesn't work. That was a big thing, too. I noticed with the law enforcement guys, a lot of guys had, you know, really never kind of ferreted it out or, or looked at it that way. They were like, oh, shit. I'm like, you look, how are you supposed to run somebody down? They're like, I'm just going to radio it in. <laughs> right. You know, so like that ability to like, you know, have a solid strength template, a conditioning, look at different energy systems. And then on the top of it, just being proficient with your hands. Uh, And then, you know, the other one, um, which I think is a big deterrent for you guys, is um, be an impressive motherfucker. Like when you go out on patrol and you get out of the car, if you're in good shape, I wonder how many problems that alleviates right there if a guy gets out and he's in pretty good shape and he looks pretty fit. Oh, yeah. FBI, the study's been done on this. On, they interview people after the fact and you know and say well why or why did you not decide to fight and so most often the answer is he looks like he could take care of himself or he looks like he could handle himself he looks like he could catch me uh, that's a big factor huge factor yeah uh so i totally off topic but i have to ask uh <laughs> whenever you were working you know in your w- when you were with your agency and you tackled somebody did you ever introduce yourself after the fact as a t- as a veter- 10 year veteran of the NFL and no, and explain no. to them why it hurt so bad <laughs> no no but uh uh I just, the one I, thing that, the, the, the one thing and in, in all the interactions i had uh and, and it, it happened more than once is these dudes thought that they could outrun me <laughs> and they were like i told like i saw you and i figured i could outrun you i didn't realize you could cover ground that fast it's just a mental picture in my head of of them just picking the absolute wrong guy to run from. And it's You're like, like, this dude's like 6'5", 280, and ran a sub-5 five, five flat at the NFL Combine, and he just fucking laid me out. And, like, I, I dude, I'm not kidding. I uh, The first time, I mean, it was I, I had just kind of got in, you know, introduced. It was the first time we'd ever gone out, and we had called out on this, uh, this deal where this guy was, like, a potential arson. Like, we get the call, and the dude, like, here's another, you know, whatever the call was, and I remember he uh, looks at the fucking thing, and he's like, what? And there, and he's like, uh, it's an arson. And I looked at the dude, I'm like, what's he doing? He's like, this dude's trying to set this house, the, his mother's house on fire. And uh, I was like, is that normal? He's like, fuck, that's the first <laughs> time I ever got that call. And so we go up, and sure enough, this dude's outside, and he's like, got like a bunch of shit in front of the door, and he's throwing gasoline on this house. Oh, my God. And um, we get out, and like the guy, you know, get out, and we're like, hey, uh, what's, you know, like trying to like assess the situation. <laughs> And the dude fucking sees me and tries to take off running. And I've like natural reaction was like fucking get him. Yeah. And uh fucking laid him out. It was a nice and it was a nice hit. <laughs> so we, we got him and uh yeah, I mean, but yeah, that's what the guy was doing. So I, I remember uh, uh when doing that job, um it's almost as if uh I couldn't have made up the shit that we saw. Oh yeah. I mean, it was like, I, and I remember coming back and telling people, telling my wife and different people, and they're, they're like, no fucking way. I'm like, I swear to God, dude. I was like, I've never in my life seen shit like this. I'm like, I, and, and then Callie, who works for me, she'll call me periodically. She'll be like, John, you'll never believe this. And I'm like, I'll probably believe it, but I'll, I, I, I could never guess, you know? Like, she, uh, she came across these guys that were, like, welding some, like, weird tower that she's like, honestly, it looked like uh, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. These guys were trying to create something. And she goes, they were basically making welders out of, like, arc electricity. And he goes, I show up, and these three dudes are, like, trying to weld this thing in the middle of, like, a parking lot. And she's like, hey, what are we doing, you know? And she's like, I still don't know what the fuck they were doing, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, it's like the poor dude trying to set his mom's house on fire. Like, what that guy was thinking, who knows? Yeah. Every day is 
an adventure. But I mean, that, like, uh, I think, um, you know, James does make a valid point in terms of, you know, like, like, what are you doing for your sleeping? What are you doing for your recovery? What are you doing for all these other things? But I think at the end of the day, uh, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta prepare. I mean, I always think like, you know, prepare for the worst. I mean, what is the worst that you're going to see on a daily basis? Um, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I can imagine, uh, the worst you're going to see is probably, um, you know, I mean, probably prepare you guys for, I mean, shit, I mean, how, how many deaths have you seen? How many times have you come into a traffic accident and just seen something horrendous? I mean, to me, that's almost the worst preparation than the dude that like wants a mouth off and get in a fight. Like to me, that seems like just a, a you know, a piece of the job. But I mean, like to me, that was kind of the, the harder thing is like the amount of deaths. And then also just seeing the fucked up shit people do to each other, like, or, or people do to kids or dog. I mean, like, mm-hmm. like to me, like that's, that would be the harder part about being involved in law enforcement. Cause people were like, Oh, would you think about doing it? And I was like, you know, um, if it was just dealing with scumbags or people that wanted to be assholes that, you know, with like that type of thing where you got to engage the bad people, I was like, I think I would be okay. Uh, the one thing that would hurt me as an individual is seeing people that were innocent, um, like, you know, whether it be death. I mean, you know, you go in and some dude's fucking locked his kid in the closet for six weeks. I mean, that type of shit. Yeah. Like, to me, like, that's where I emotionally, like, couldn't deal with that job. Yeah, that's that's most definitely the challenging, most challenging part from for me, and I think that's why I enjoy the some of the more stressful workouts too, because you kind of end up leaving a lot of that there. Um, so, you know, if, let me, let me kind of pose a scenario for you and see what, see what you have to say, or let me finish off actually on the last bit. It's, it doesn't sound like you disagree with James at all because you, you said you were up all night last night with, with your kids. So you, you adjusted your priorities for the day and sure. your, and your workload and you acknowledged that you weren't going to be a hundred percent and at your best and you did what you could. Right. I mean, I think that's, yeah. I think well, that there's is... a, there's a, um, I coined the term years ago, uh, you know, and, and, and ironically, I mean, uh, like when I think back on this, I mean, dude, I, uh, I got invited to a CrossFit event in 2008. That's actually where I first met Freddie. And, um, and then geez, I went back and played for the Patriots. And then we started across the football shortly thereafter and really cross the football was my first forte and, uh, offering my brand of strength conditioning to the world. And we've done it. What's that? 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 8, oh, shit, almost nine years, uh, we've been offering the CrossFit football program, and it's really kind of led in a lot of different directions and allowed me to create some interesting things. And I think the one thing that I really realized about training the masses and, and uh, you know, the problem I have is I'm a fucking terrible elitist. Um, having played in the NFL for 10 years, I sit in this really, really, really small little ivory tower of people because it's just not that many people were able to do that job. And so my perspective is kind of fucked up. And when I got involved in CrossFit and started offering strength conditioning for a bunch of people, I mean, my first question when CrossFit at, or my first response when CrossFit asked me if I wanted to offer a CrossFit style program was, uh, do you think normal people want to know this shit? And they were like, yeah, I'm like, why? why? Uh, I go to the gym and you know, when I go to a commercial gym, I just see people doing fucking nonsense. Like, you think people actually want to know, like, what a legitimate strength conditioning program for professional athlete looks like? And CrossFit was like, yeah, I think people would be interested. And I was like, fuck, I, you know, I, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> but the one thing that I really coined over the years as, uh, you know, because I started playing in the NFL when I was 23. I retired when I was 32. And, you know, when you're 32, you're feeling pretty good. And then after 10 years in the NFL, the body's beat down. And I got into this mentality of what's called move the dirt, where, um, you know, and, and somebody asked me about training and, you know, I said, you know, training's a lot like moving a big pile of dirt. And I rem- and the, the analogy I gave was actually when we were kids, uh, we had a real wood burning fire, which they probably don't allow anymore. But twice a year we would come home and my mom liked to burn a fire and my dad would order a huge cord of wood and they would just drop it on our driveway. And coming home from school, like at least, you know, twice a year, once a year, we'd walk up and I would see this fucking enormous mountain of wood. And I knew that our job was to stack the wood before my dad got home or he or we were going to be in trouble. So my brothers and I would drop our backpacks, like walk back from the bus, and we would literally just start stacking the wood. And we knew if we did a shitty job, my dad would come and inspect it. And if he had to redo it, then he was going to be pissed. And then we were on Saturday, we were going to have to redo it anyway. So we like took our time. We always stacked the wood. And it's a lot like stacking wood or moving dirt that, 
you know what, like when you start out, you try to grab like four pieces at once and stack them. And then over time you go down to one piece and you just keep moving back and forth. And as long as you keep moving, you just keep stacking the wood or moving the dirt. And the analogy I gave was like training is like a big pile of dirt. And, you know, some days you might get a big ass shovel. And you might get 50, you know, big, you know, big shovel loads and you get to move it. Other days you might be out there with a spoon and just like kind of move the spoon and throw it over. But as long as each day I'm either stacking wood or moving dirt, I'm eventually going to get to my goal. Now, if I don't do anything and I don't pick up a spoon, I don't pick up a shovel, I don't even kick the dirt, then, uh, you know, I don't get anywhere. And that analogy really, really rang home for me, especially in my own training, because as I, uh, you know, ended up, you know, starting across the football, owning a gym, having all these other businesses, my training became secondary, whereas my training and getting ready to play football was my life. And now all of a sudden here, my training becomes secondary and it had to take a priority. I had to build a successful business. I had to become, reinvent myself from what I once was. And that moving the dirt analogy really rang home. And when I talked about it on my Talk to Me Johnny blog, dude, it, it like fucking rang true with everybody. People were like, holy shit, that is, that's an analogy for training. And it really just came out of that whole, you know, stack and wood thing. And, uh, I mean, I wonder if my kids will even know what stacking wood is. I might just have to cut wood just to make them stack it now that I think about it. Uh, but, like, you know, that becomes the training and that becomes the kind of the method. I mean, you know, like, you, you know, your kid's up four times in a night. You're tired. You know, you, you got to be at work because you got to do this illustrious podcast at 9 a.m. You have all these things to do. And so you're like, all right, how much time do I have available to me? What's the best I can get out? I got to move the dirt today. And you know what? Today we just did 30 minutes and just basically just kept moving. And other days tomorrow, we probably, you know, I'll try to get Luke sick. But, you know, Luke is uh, the only person on the planet that I know that is actually uh, medically allergic to deadlifting. <laughs> um, he has a doctor's note that he can't deadlift because he does. He usually gets violently ill. So we'll deadlift tomorrow and I'll try to get him sick for the weekend. And um, But, I mean, that's kind of my philosophy on training, especially with, you know, in this type of situation is, you know what, like, like you said, every day is not going to be perfect, so I don't expect it to be. So I have to have some inherent periodization to train within, you know, to have the flexibility to kind of adjust my training. So on that note of priorities and, you know, life takes over, job takes over, overtime shifts, whatnot, if, you know, a question I often ask guests is, you know, if someone has get, is, has an hour, one hour a day to devote to their health, whether that's their nutrition, their physical exercise, their mental wellness, whatever it is, how would you divide up that hour? Um, I have a good friend, a guy named Dr. Tom Inkledon, and Tom is uh, out in Scottsdale, Arizona. He has a place called Human Performance Specialist, and uh, Tom's probably got about 180 IQ and uh, probably knows more about training, fitness, and nutrition than any other individual I've ever met on the planet. I've been fortunate to know Tom. started working with him in like 2000, and he does all my blood work and supplements and does some things. And I remember uh, we were out to dinner, and Luke asked him, Luke who works for, uh, with me, um, asked him a question. He said, hey, Doc, if, uh, if uh, all three things being equal, if you could only select one, sleep, nutrition, or exercise, which one would you select? And Tom went and he basically starts spouting off all his research and he goes, you know, with all the research, everything you can talk about, the one thing that I've legitimately seen that you can almost like make up for, like if you don't train and you don't sleep, it doesn't really matter how good you eat. If you eat like shit, you don't train and you sleep great, it doesn't really matter. He goes, the only thing I've seen people do is with crappy sleep and bad nutrition, as long as their training was dialed, it seemed to play better dividends than the other two. So he's like, you know, all things being equal, if uh, if you had to say, you know, one's amazing and two are crappy, he said, take the crappy sleep, take the crappier diet, and make sure your training's ama- amazing. So uh, for me, that was pretty pretty revolutionary because I had always kind of thought like, well, if uh, my training sucks and my sleep isn't great, if I ate perfect, because I was on the idea that like if the diet's perfect, I shouldn't have any problems. And uh, Tom actually kind of reversed it and he said, you know, I've seen um, some really interesting metabolic changes for people that just don't do any physical exercise. So he's like, as long as you're doing something physical, he goes, you know, you hear the old stories of the, you know, the 87 year old farmer who, you know, ate bacon and, you know, uh, uh, you know, white bread and, you know, fried chicken and, you know, seven pots of coffee every day, you know, and, and went to bed late and woke up in the rooster's crow at 3 a.m. But yet the guy went out and worked his ass off all single day. And the guy lives to be 80, 90 years old, smoking two packs of cigarettes. And he goes, there's more stories about that guy than there are the guy who, you know, didn't sleep, didn't exercise, but yet ate amazing. He goes, have you ever heard about that guy? And I'm like, no, nah, you only ever hear about the old farmer story. 
And uh, he's like, yeah, he goes, you know, there was something to be said about manual labor, about physical exercise, staying in shape and working your body and not letting things pot away. So I think for you guys, uh, you know, I, I now that doesn't give you a license to sleep like shit, eat like shit and then train your ass off. But I think for you guys, um, if uh, if you can almost get two out of three. Um, you know, and I, I, I've really seen, and, and the, the, this is universally acceptable or universal for most guys in this tactical response deal. I mean, the, the guys at Naval Special Warfare were the fucking worst when they go out and they do their training trips. Like they're like, let's say they go to like, you know, mid South or different places to go to shooting schools or on the road for two weeks. Those dudes eat at gas stations. They eat at fucking fast food. I mean, they literally go off the reservation. And I remember asking them, like, why? There's grocery stores everywhere. Well, you know, they just get lazy. And I, I think law enforcement guys do the same thing. Instead of, like, you know, and I'm sure there are guys that do, but instead of, like, looking at it and saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to pack the lunch. I'm going to get a cooler. I'm going to put all my food. I'm going to, you know, put some reminders on my phone. I'm going to actually have a, a nutritional plan, and I'm going to know what to eat during my shift. And it's going to take – it's going to suck. I'm probably going to need somebody to help me, but I'm going to put time and effort into meal prep. I think that mixed with some good training – and, uh, you know, try to get as much sleep as you can, I think is the only real strategy. And then, um, try to avoid the doctor as much as possible. I find most of my people, every time they go to the doctor, they don't leave without some form of medication. So I, I had one of my guys be like, every time I go to the doctor, he goes to medication. What should I do? I'm like, I don't want to go to the doctor anymore. <laughs> and he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, dude. Uh, you know, every time I go to the doctor, uh, they either want to give me a pill or something else. And, um, you know, so I just figure out, like, hey, man, if, if, uh, if they're not going to do something to actively fix me um, and all you're going to do is offer me just pills instead of saying, hey, you know, you got to make a lifestyle change or a diet change or an exercise, you got to lose 20 pounds. I mean, shit, I've had clients that, you know, the doctor's like, well, you can lose 20 pounds, I can give you this pill. And like, what should I do? I'm like, lose the fucking 20 pounds. Fuck, go sit in a sweat lodge somewhere in, like, fucking the Navajo Indian tribe <laughs> where it's 110 degrees or something. Do something. Find a vision quest. Do something to lose this weight. Right. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it's really, uh, you know, like the, uh, it, it, something else I wrote in my blog once, uh, and I think about this all the time is, um, nobody's coming to save you. Like, that's a big thing. Like I think about for like first responders and law enforcement and just people in general, like, I think people are always secretly hoping that like somebody's going to be there to safety net them. And you guys know you go out on patrol. I mean, you know, you have the opportunity to call somebody and, and get back up. But what if that person doesn't come? Are you able to handle every situation that comes out with you if nobody's coming to save you? And I think like taking that mentality with training and looking at like what's the worst? What might, what might I have to encounter? And more importantly, can I, you know, can I prevail in all these different situations? And um, I hope that answer is always yes. I just don't know if that's true for everybody. I mean, it's not true in the law enforcement community. It's not true in, in the civilian community. People are, aren't really prepared for what's coming. And, you know, I mean, think, think about, um, I, I remember there was like a, a bunch of years ago, there was a blackout from like Orange County to San Diego. And after not having power, or any cell phones or anything for like three hours, people started like losing their mind and like looting liquor store uh, or like looting uh, 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 supermarkets and like stealing ice and like siphoning gas and doing crazy shit. And, like, that was just three hours without power. Like, I just wonder if people are really, like, you know, if this, like, fad called the Internet turned off, are people really prepared for it? Right. You know? I so, don't, I don't think that that's movie, my social commentary. I don't think that movie, The Purge, is that far off. <laughs> uh, you know, and if it was, would you be ready? <laughs> yeah. Like, that's a big one. Like, I remember we watched and people were like, oh, my God, uh, uh, you know, what, what did you think? I'm like, I don't know. Who, who would you be? Would you be the person in the house or the person outside? Yeah. You know, and I think uh, this idea too that no one's coming to save you. I mean, obviously, there's that's immediately identifiable and relatable to law enforcement. But as just as an adult trying to you know manage your own fitness and manage your own nutrition and sleep, it's like it's on you, right? I mean, there, yeah. you can you can hire a coach, you can hire, uh, you can get good blood work done and all those things. But it's really up to you about what you put into it. There's nobody who's going to rip my covers off at zero uh, five thirty and bark at me to get out of bed and then follow me throughout the day to make sure I do everything right. I mean, I, I do that for my kids, but there's a reason, <laughs> I, there's a reason I'm an adult and they're a kid. Right. And so at some point in our lives, we lose that immediate supervision of do this, do this, do this, 
and we feel liberated as adults, but it, there's a double-edged sword to that, that now it's all on you and, and really there's well, no excuses to be made. Don't you think people need accountability? I, I, I think that's the one thing that we've tried to do with our power athlete community is this idea of uh, accountability. Um, you fucking owe yourself and you owe me. And I tell people that all the time. I'm like, don't fail me. I've, put, I've, I've invested time into you and don't fail me. And we have a lot of people that take that shit seriously. They're like, dude, I, uh, you know, I, I got an email the other day for uh, a guy who's um, you know, uh, uh, active, you know, uh, does some clandestine stuff, and you know, military guy, and a you know, uh, pretty high-level dude, and sent me an email that's like, thanks. Like, um, you know, we have teams in different situations, and he goes, you know, being involved in, in your community, he goes, you know, you take that team mentality where it's like, you know, like, you know, you know, I don't want you to fail me. And, that, you know, and that, that, that kind of comes from football. Um, you know, I was fortunate in that I played offensive line. And even though I didn't really care for a lot of the people I actually physically worked with, we had this mutual understanding that uh, we are going to work together to kick ass and win. Because winning is the fucking only thing that matters. And so I might not like your politics. I might not like the fact that you fucking cheat on your wife or you're a degenerate and spend all your money at strip clubs or uh, – um, which I don't have any problem with, but just, you know, don't spend all your money. They want to borrow it from me um, or, you know, or, or anything else or like, you know, uh, you know, I don't really give a shit about any of that stuff. We have an understanding on terms of professional level that our job is to work together and you put in the same training and preparedness so that we can effectively do this job to win. And the guys that took their job seriously and we had that understanding, we did fine with. And if a guy didn't, I would motherfuck him to the end of the end of the earth. Because for me, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, people love the game of football. Um, to tell the truth, the game to me, I could care less about. Uh, I just only like the fact that I got to line up and stand across another or three, you know, three feet from another motherfucker that wanted to try to beat my ass for three hours, and I wasn't going to lose. And like to me, that was what I liked about the game. You know, uh, the rules of football, the hoopla, the crowd, all that other bullshit didn't ever matter to me. It was all about the one-on-one physical con- uh, conflict and the combat. And um, what I wanted everybody there to understand is that we work as a unit so that we can effectively do our job. And I think that team mentality of, like, we're all in this together, not from, like, the fucking Rudy bullshit, typical, like, yay, rah-rah stuff. No, we have a mission. Mm-hmm. We have a very, very defined objective which is we need to be able to do this so that we can move on and, and win. And I think like with our power athlete uh, community, I mean, that type of attitude instilled in people, and I call people out on shit all the time, you know, in the training. Like a guy was like, well, you know, uh, how come we squatted two RMs after we did power clean two RMs? I felt tired. And I was like, have you been doing this fucking program? You should have 100% the strength and capacity to do two max effort lifts. And the fact that you're fucking whining bothers me. And the dude was like, oh, I didn't mean to. I'm like, fuck. Dude, this isn't some just innocuous fucking, you know, thing that you can post on. This is shit we are actively doing because we're actively doing this training. Like, I'm living and breathing this stuff. I'm just not making this shit up on some whiteboard and throwing it out there so I can sell you something on $20. It's not like that. It's a social experiment because, unfortunately, people need some direction. I need direction. Like you said, nobody's coming to wake you up. Fuck, my wife at 530 is like, get up. And I'm like laying there and she's like, are you going to the gym? And it's a rhetorical question because she knows I'm going. Right. And she's like, are you going to the gym? I'm like, are we going to ask this question? She's like, yes, I'm going to ask you every day if you're going to the gym. And I get up and like I go out and like, like I'll walk out and I'll try to turn on the coffee. When it's all dark, she'll come on and turn on the lights and she'll be like, come on, let's go. Let's go. You got to go. <laughs> and she, and she, she literally pushes, pushes me out. And uh, uh, she's great. I mean, uh, you know, that type of mentality. But she's also understands that if I don't train or if I don't do these things, then – Either I come home pissed off or this or I don't feel right or like, you know, this. so I mean, it's, it's all maintenance. So no, I, I think having a, a, you know, somebody that's on board like my, I mean, you know, and unfortunately a lot of people don't have that. So, you know, they either got to get off the internet, they got to hire a coach or, you know, in your guys situation, I mean, the one thing I like to enjoy about law enforcement, like the military is uh, ridicule is a very real uh, fucking technique. I mean, and I, I, I'm sure it's going away, but like, I'm, I mean, uh, cops like to talk shit. That's the one thing I appreciate. Like I like to talk, you know, I, I like to talk shit too. And I, I thought that the ridicule that the guys were able to ridicule each other was really positive. But people get butt hurt on that shit, and and people get upset. But I think like ridiculing and feeling like you are not living up to your peers' expectations. I think that's a powerful thing and something I think that's not a bad thing. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think the connection, like 
you know, law enforcement is very much a team sport. And um, I, I totally understand what you're saying and and all that. And, and that I, I have found through talking with other people here that it's it's the closer that the, te- the the closer that the agency feels like they're working as a team uh and that there's more esprit de corps so to speak that the more uh not only the more morale they have but they they do have more of a focus on on fitness and fitness for the sake of their partner and i think that's why you see uh swat teams regardless of agency are typically in such good shape not only because they get to work out on duty often but there is more of a expectation of your partner within the insular group of the SWAT team, even within the larger agency. Um, sure. And so you're talking about uh, when you talk about clients, you're you're talking about your clients from Power Athlete. You started Power Athlete how many years ago? Um, it was kind of an interesting evolution in that uh, we launched across a football program. Uh, we launched, and then people we got like seventeen thousand hits the first day in like a hundred plus countries. And then um, people wanted to know more about the program, so we created a seminar for CrossFit, um, and we taught that seminar. And I remember uh, I was getting like two to 400 emails a day, and as I first got those emails, like, what do you do? Like, people send you emails, you respond to them. Mm-hmm. So as I was sitting there for like 18 hours a day trying to respond to all these fucking emails, I like was thinking to myself, I was like, dude, I, I, I got to do something better. This is going to kill me. And I started... Uh, my own personal blog blog called uh, talk to me johnny which is um just based off of one of my favorite movies which is first blood when uh, uh colonel troutman is like you know coven leader to raven talk to me johnny and uh you know rambo pipes up and he's like they're all dead sir so there's like kind of a, a little bit of black blog i mean i'm a fan of of uh, really of of good movies which was really anything in the 70s 80s and even the 90s anything after that's really been kind of touch and go uh and I started this blog and I started answering questions. So, cause I figured, um, a lot of the questions I was getting were repeaters. So if I just answered questions, I could really help people. And I got this interesting email, uh, question that was, uh, what would CrossFit football like look like if there was no CrossFit? And I was like, Oh, all right. So I posted up, I answered his question and I posted something that was called the power athlete template. And I had always in my head kind of, um, when people asked me, you know, oh, are you an athlete? To me, whenever somebody was like, you know, skill player, skill athlete, was like the skinny fuckers that catch the ball or play away from the ball. And then when, you know, and I never liked the whole being like, oh, hogs or the big dudes or that. And I was like, nah, dude, we're a bunch of strong fucking powerful motherfuckers. And I was like, if they're skill athletes, we're power athletes. And so I started, like, I always had that kind of mental change like big strong powerful dude that can run through a fucking brick wall that's a power athlete and so that's how i always kind of classified myself when everybody's like well do you really look at yourself as a football player i'm like nah i'm a power athlete and um so i came out with my power athlete template and then i got like a bunch of email requests from people asking me for them to write them a program based off of this power athlete template and I, i i thought i was like well shit if uh if i'm getting this many emails and and contacts then maybe there's something to this. And so um, we launched a site that was called Power Athlete, and Power Athlete HQ is the URL. And it was really what I was doing in terms of that, and that became our information resource. And then uh, after about two years, we just got s- literally like hit up by so many people for, for programming that I didn't really have the ability to have private clients anymore. It was just too many. And we just put some programming up, and like, dude, we ended up with like you know thousands of people following the program. And then I started getting more and more emails that was like, you know, and the original program is called Field Strong. And uh, the reason it's called Field Strong was um, I, when playing football, I used to classify people in two ways. There were guys that were weight room strong, and then there were dudes that were like field strong. There were guys that were cock strong. I mean, you know, I'm sure you've, you've met, you know, you've fought or, or done anything. You've at some point run into a dude when he puts his hands on you, you feel like a little kid playing with your dad. Right, yeah. And like playing football, we used to run into it all the time. I might go out and I'd see a dude in the weight room bench and 600 pounds for reps and we'd go out on the field and I'd hit the dude and he'd like fucking shatter. And I'd play against other guys that were, you know, maybe not that strong in the weight room or if they were, but all of a sudden you went out there and they was like, they had like this inner power, like this inertia. They'd put their hands in you and you'd be like, uh, uh. I remember one guy I used to call him the rock biter because he looked, because he reminded me of in the never ending story. You remember the big rock biter that was able to like smash the boulders? <laughs> Like, that's like how he, like, that's how strong he was. And yet the dude wasn't real strong in the weight room, but yet he had this like weird country strong, field strong, 
cock strong. He was just, you know, and like I, I can give a, a, a million different definitions for it and everybody knows what I'm talking about. So the program was based off of this idea that, and what I always believed is that if you could do your training in such a way in the weight room, out of the weight room in different ways, that you could effectively develop field strength. And uh, that was what the program was based off, this idea that I firmly believe it because I was one of those dudes that was, you know, field strong, cock strong, and yet I was weight room strong. And I believe I developed my field strength in the weight room because it was from my training and how I looked at training with, you know, compensatory acceleration, you know, being able to add some, you know, heavy, hard, odd implements. I mean, a lot of grip stuff, a lot of pulling, and uh, just a lot of dynamic movement. I mean, everything in the weight room I do is uh, um, there's no time under tension. So there's no, you know, James Fitzgerald, uh, you know, you know, Polycon, you know, one, four, three, two time under tension bullshit. It is. I'm going to move this weight from point A to point B as fast as humanly possible, and I'm going to keep accelerating the weight at all times. And that compensatory acceleration that you know was taught to me years ago in uh, the old powerlifters garage I trained in comes from Fred Hatfield. And that idea of basically always trying to move as fast as I can at all times, with you know regardless of what I do, uh, I think translated on the field for me and allowed me to be very successful. And it was based off of these ideas, and so we offered it in the program and. Um, People fucking loved it, and everybody got big and strong. Awesome. And then I got, and, and then I got hit up by people that were like, "Yo, man, um, I just want to get jacked." And I was like, "Well, I got this program called Jack Street, which was another joke that when somebody got like kind of big and strong, we'd be like, "Damn, that dude moved on Jack Street. He looks fucking good." <laughs> and so that was a program. And so we just really started adding different programs based off of the needs of people. And um, you know, and I started classifying people. You know, there's guys that just want to be in good shape. There's other people that want to be, you know, a more complete athlete. And there's other people that just need a program that's able to be flexible, which is our grindstone program, which I wrote for a Fortune 500 uh, CEO who, you know, had a you know 80, 90 hour work week that needed to fit his training and to be flexible. So we've created a bunch of different programs, and um, you know, the idea was that you know hopefully we have something that uh, you know based off the power athlete model that can really be universally acceptable to everybody. Freddie was telling me about Grindstone. That's the one he's using in that. He he hit me up uh, when we started talking about how, how you'd be great to be on the show, and it was like he's he's a big fan of of that program. What about what it is about Grindstone that you think works well for law enforcement? And, wh- and what are some uh, of the specifics of that program? Well, what I like is that the program's flexible. It's based off of two mandatory days, two recommended days, and then optional days. So, uh, you know, and what, what I, well, what's hard with law enforcement, especially for you guys is your, you know, your schedule might be set. It might change. Um, you know, you might work overtime, you different things. So being like a structured program, like, Hey, I got to be at my CrossFit gym every day at five thirty, and, you know, uh, you know, it might not work for me, but yet if I don't go on Thursday, I'm not going to get any strength work in because we only do strength work on Mondays and Thursdays. And so what I wanted to do is design a program that was like, if you only could train two days a week, what's the most important deal? Right? I want you to do the strength work. I want you to do a ton of trunk work. And I want you to stay strong. Because what I realized, too, is that if you gave me, I could probably get you in the best shape of your life in about 8 to 12 weeks. But I couldn't get you strong in 8 to 12 weeks. Because divine strong. I mean, I can get you stronger. But to somebody to be disgustingly really strong where you're like, fuck that motherfucker's bend some bars and kick in walls. I mean, that takes a lifetime to do. So what I really realized is that if given all things equal, if you could only train two days a week, basically doing some strength work with just a little bit of conditioning will be fine. And then as it kind of gets bigger and, hey, maybe I can add a third or fourth or a fifth week, then, you know, we started looking at a hierarchy. So I kind of looked things down in terms of like building it up. Like, hey, I'm going to give you two strength workouts and then I'm going to give you two conditioning workouts. And then really that fifth workout is going to be what I call my aerobic capacity, um, which is also super important and something I didn't understand until I started working with just some older athletes, that the ability to develop aerobic capacity does a few things. One, it increases mitochondrial density, but also um, you know, uh, allows people to keep you know, uh, you know, just that base level of conditioning, which – it's kind of funny. I mean, I, I blew it off for years. I was like, ah, what the fuck? I don't need to be in aerobic shape. I run, I sprint, everything we do is glycolytic. But when I started really looking at it and looking at it from like a recovery point of view, and um, the way I got through it was uh, Joel Jameson. He has that heart rate variability. Uh, he sent me one of the units and asked me to test it. And 
I would wake up and then you kind of check your heart rate availability. It would give you a number or a color based on what, you know, what you should do. And then, you know, if it was green, that means go hundred miles an hour. If it was, you know, a different color, you know, you could periodize your training based off it. And, um, I started using it for a couple weeks and I started kind of following the model. Uh, and then I decided, I was like, you know what, what if before I went to bed, I tried some active recovery work? Like, what if I just rode the aerodyne for 20 or 30 minutes, you know, 70% heart rate and just did some basic aerobic work. And, uh, I started doing that every night before bed. I just basically did like 20, 30 minutes. I take the dogs on a walk and every night and regardless of what my training looked like, my color and my number was, was green. So I, I, we started having these like brutal workouts, like, Hey, I'm going to fucking try to bang weights for two or three hours. I'm going to try to kill myself and I'm going to feel terrible. I'm going to feel beat up, but I'm going to ride the bike every time before night. And every time I rode the bike, it was green. The days I didn't ride the bike, it wasn't. Hmm. And so I realized that maybe there was something to this getting in shape, creating aerobic base. And so we did a program, which was 22 weeks. And I was doing, you know, I started at like three days, four days, five days. And I started doing some form of aerobic work seven days a week. And, uh, all of a sudden my strength, like blew up. Like, uh, I ended up, uh, leaning out. I mean, it's pretty funny. I think I ended up like the day we finished, I was like, you know, 268 pounds at 7% body fat. And like, uh, you know, my strength just shot up and I was like, huh, wow. I, uh, didn't see that one coming at all. And it, it was, it was just the fact that I think I was recovered in a way by developing this big aerobic base that the strength work ended up being really good. Good, and everything just kind of came in. Um, so it was, it was pretty interesting. So I, I, I think uh, uh, that type of stuff, I mean, it could have been I was training two days a week, I mean, or two times a day, I mean, all these different factors, but I really think there's something to building an aerobic base, whether it be, you know, capillary density or a mitochondrial density, you know, getting capillary refill, you know, uh, you know, heart health, I mean, all the other bullshit that I poo-hooed for so long, I think there's really something to it. So you've worked with a lot of different types of athletes, and obviously you're connected closely to CrossFit, uh, or, or at least were. And um, so I want to go through some of the kind of the, like the traditional or standard modes of exercise, and I want I'd like to get your perspective on it on the weaknesses specifically of each in terms of what it's not offering law enforcement, right? So I guess for starting out with well, the first one would be CrossFit. You know, your traditional go to a box, you do the wad of the day, you leave. There's a lot of benefits to that. But in terms of for the law enforcement officer, what do you see as lacking in the CrossFit model? Is there anything? Uh, you know, CrossFit's, it, cro you know, I mean, CrossFit's pretty interesting in that, um, uh, you know, the definition of CrossFit is increased work capacity, broad time, modal domains, the, or functional movements performed at high intensity. Um, so really anything you know, like you can define a functional movement any way. And as long as you're doing functional movements performed at high intensity, technically you're doing something that looks like CrossFit. Now, we've all eaten at a lot of different, let's say, let's pick Italian food or Mexican food. We've eaten at a lot of different Mexican food restaurants. Some are really good. Some are really shitty, but you're all eating Mexican food. And I think with the CrossFit, uh, your experience and your performance and what you get from CrossFit is 100 depend dependent upon the gym you were going to and the program you were following. Um, I've been very fortunate to run into some really amazing coaches that write some really great CrossFit stuff that periodize, uh, you know, when I, when I use the term periodize, you know, cycle through different, you know, different skill work. They, uh, they have strength templates. They like to focus on, you know, whether it be some gymnastics, some Oli. I mean, there's different, you know, uh, um, like the program just isn't 20 minutes, rev them up, fucking, you know, let the bodies hit the floor, spit in my mouth and give me 300 quotes, you know, and like, let's fucking kill each other for fucking 20 minutes. And my hands are tearing. I'm on the ground in a heap of fucking bloody mess. Now, I think you have to do that every time, every little bit just to make sure, you know, fucking morale doesn't get low because you got to like beat people up a little bit to get a little bit of Stockholm syndrome. So I think you got to do a little bit of that. But I think the ones that are really successful are the ones that understand how to cycle the program and the ones that aren't and the ones that torch people out of the guys that don't understand it and just fucking try to kill everybody every single day. So I think for somebody in the law enforcement community, they have to find a CrossFit gym. And I, 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 I think what's, what's really interesting too. And I, and I wrestle with this a lot is, uh, you know, people kind of poo hoo CrossFit and this, and these guys went to weekend seminars and know what the fuck they're doing. Um, have you ever been to a commercial gym? 
Oh, yeah. It's fucking terrible. Yeah, yeah. We belong to a commercial gym up the street, and we go, and literally we go, and I cannot believe the fucking bullshit people do. And I, 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 I made the comment. I was like, I don't know why people talk shit on CrossFit. It's a thousand times better than this fucking nonsense that I see at, at every other fucking place. I mean, you go to a CrossFit gym, and you see people squatting actually to depth. Uh, I've never in my life been to a, a commercial gym where I've seen anybody squat to any type of depth. Uh, depth. I've never seen anybody pull a bar with a good flat back. I mean, just basic barbell training. And even the gym we went to, I remember the owner came up to me. He's like, what do you think? I'm like, I think you need to have a basic barbell seminar for not only your trainers, but all your coach, uh, all your clients. I was like, we'll come and teach a barbell seminar here every single weekend to the end of fucking time. That's how bad people are. And the guy was like, really? I'm like, yeah. I was like, it's fucking terrible. I was like, that's why you guys have machines. Right. Because it's easier just to stick somebody on a machine than actually teach them to do shit. So, uh, like, the thing, like, pe- people can, you know, poo-hoo CrossFit and say, you know, it's this and that. And But I think CrossFit has done more for strength and conditioning than anything else on the planet. And one, it's introduced people to the barbell, which of all of the shit, everything that we've seen, is the single most important thing in this whole deal. Is that if you can use a barbell in terms of just basic and I'm not, and I hate, I'm not even going to use the word functional movement, but like what I call basal primal movements, which would be like a bilateral hip hinge, which would be like a squat, a deadlift, a press, a bench, you know, some form of dynamic stuff. I mean, just basic barbell movements. I mean, really when I look at what barbell movements are teaching, it's just a way for us to teach posture and strength and posture through full ranges of motion. I mean, why do we really lift weights? Let's say you put a heavy bar on your back. All I'm going to do now is going to, I'm going to get up in a good starting position, you know, feet shoulder width apart. I'm going to stand up straight in a good position, good posture. You know, I'm not going to slouch. I'm going to sit up nice and good, you know, put the bar on a nice stable platform on my back. And now I'm going to sit down into a squatted position all the way down, hopefully, uh, full range of motion. And I'm going to stand back up in a good position. So our most basic primal movements, I mean, you watch little kids, right? What do they do? They, they crawl, all of a sudden they you know, push themselves up and they squat up and they stand up. One of the, the, the most simple positions. And here we are strengthening that position or challenging that position using external resistance, a.k.a. a barbell. So that's all we're teaching. We're just teaching movement, we're teaching posture, and we're challenging movement and posture with a barbell. Right? You pull a bar off the ground, another primal movement. You horizontal press, uh, uh, you know, vertical press, horizontal pull vertical pull, basic pull up, just basic type movements that, so tend, I tend to go off on these tangents, but don't mind. Uh, the idea of what, what is the biggest benefit is that it's introduced people to barbells and it's actually teaching basic barbell training in such a way that's good. And on top of it, it's, you know, I think empowering people to do something they didn't think they could do. Uh, the one thing that I really liked when I owned a CrossFit gym is, uh, you know, I, I ran into people all the time that were like, you know, uh, doing this training has given me the confidence to go do other things. I didn't think I could do this, but I knew if I could do this, I could do this. And I always thought that was good. I mean, I always liked the fact that if just basically lifting weights and, and doing some form of barbell stuff, a little bit of conditioning, you know, push the prowl or do different things, if that allows and empowers you to do something better, then it was a home run. Um, I think, uh, the one mistake that I've seen with the CrossFit gyms is, uh, they try to get too fucking jiggy, like fucking basic things have been killing people for years. Try to be as basic and as simple. Now, unfortunately you don't retain members that way because people have the, uh, um, you know, the attention of a, um, fucking squirrel on methamphetamine. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, oh, uh, you know, well, this gym does wad three days a week, so I should go there. And you're like, dude. Just chill the fuck out. You're going to be here for five years. Let's start simple. Let's start with the basic barbells. Like let's teach the uh, uh, the simple things and 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 just fucking move on. I, I remember um, uh, when people asked me about you know what was the biggest revelation with uh, with your CrossFit, and I was like you know we we had this huge problem where uh, people were cutting reps and cheating. Like that was a huge problem for us. Like uh, we were like you know people would be like hey so and so's fucking t-, you know they wrote their name first on the board they put up their time they totally lied they cut reps. And, like, people were pissed off about it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to solve this. I'm going to count everybody's reps. So I started secretly counting people's reps. And of all the people, and this one tripped me out, we only had two clients that, well, like, we we had a lot of people that were right on the money. I'd say, like, 40% of the people were on the money. 20% of the people always missed reps. But the smallest percentage was I had two people that ended up always doing more. 
And I remember one one of the guys, uh, uh, Josh, I asked him, I'm like, dude, you know, called for 10 reps and he did 12. And he's like, well, I, I you know, if I, you know, I get in there, I can't always remember, but he goes, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of here. So if I can get a couple extra reps for free, then uh, technically I should get my performance. Uh, the other one is my wife, who is terrible at counting. So if she forgot where she was with the number, she just started over at zero. Oh, <laughs> and surprisingly, do you know which two people were the one of the most dom- or the two most dominant people in our gym and in the best shape was my wife and this other guy. And the people that were in the worst shape that never committed that were like n- never got the results they want were the people that always cut reps. And I like I don't know if there was a social commentary on the fact that maybe the people over time, like the amount of work they were doing was greater was equaling it or maybe they were just more honest with themselves or maybe it was just more important to them. But like it was weird. Like the people that never got the results were always the people that cut the reps. And so I always think about it like you know when, when we uh, when we lift weights, one of the guys like I'm terrible at counting too. Like you did nine reps, and I'm like, oh shit, I did. And he's like, yeah, but you did 14 on the one before. I'm like, well then it all evens out in the end. So I think just having uh, you know if I was going to send a law enforcement guy into a CrossFit gym, I would ask them to say, hey, you know, like what's the plan here? What's the end game? Um, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, how are you going to help me? Cause I'm planning on being a client for a number of years and I want to make sure I'm really good at this stuff. I mean, the people that came in that wanted to be really good at the basic barbell stuff always ended up becoming really good as, as time went on. The people that took attention to detail in the beginning ended up always being really good. Um, which is just like anything. If you learn the fundamentals and basics, then you don't have to fucking go back and learn them. Uh, think about shooting, for example. Um, uh, you know, that was one that tripped me out because uh, n- nobody really ever taught me to shoot. I just r- ended up watching people shoot, and I fucking had a lot of uh, uh, habits to break. And I remember when I started working with some really good people with guns, um, basically breaking bad habits and learning how to do it. And then I took Luke and the guys that worked for me who had really little any type of pistol experience, and I remember Jeff Gonzalez came and worked with them. And he's like, they don't have any bad habits. He taught them exactly what he wanted to do, and that's all they knew. And I think the CrossFit stuff is the same way. Find somebody that's really good at the basic barbell movements, that has attention to detail, that really cares. Just don't go into the gym where it's the fucking music and the fucking dickhead coaches on his phone the whole time. And, like, you know, like, you know the deal. And yeah. just, I would avoid that. Um, I want to ask one last question about kind of the same idea, but for, you know, there's a lot of uh, law enforcement that are, aerobic athletes you know runners triathlon kind of people sure what do they need to work on in terms of strength strength and and their adaptability on the job yeah i mean i i I think if you're a triathlete and that model works uh i remember we had a guy named rob miller on our podcast who was uh one of the original crossfit guys and i met him at my seminar years ago and rob was one of the uh the top climbers in the world he's like a long distance like climb this you know nobody's ever climbed this route in yosemite and i've been up there for 17 days type of thing and uh rob got into the crossfit and had this idea that if he could develop uh you know glycolytic capacity and this and functionally performed at high intensity it could help his climbing and he didn't find that um for him he found that uh the best way for him to increase at his sport was to basic barbell movements get strong with the barbell and then periodize the distances in which he trained. So he would boulder, which is like a fast kind of like 20 minute type thing where he would climb. He would do kind of long, you know, intermediate stuff that might be like, you know, three or four hours. And then he would go long and do his longer stuff. And so he looked at like this kind of this template of short, medium, long and basic barbell movements. And he's like, honestly, the conditioning I need is so ultra specific to what I'm doing that going in and doing a CrossFit workout didn't really help me in terms of the way that I thought it would. But the one thing that he found was solid gold was the basic barbell movements. So I think for any type of, and we, I did, I've worked with triathletes. I've worked with a lot of aerobic type athletes. And the one thing they all lack is basic strength. Um, and it's just because, you know, if you sit on a bike all day, there's really no eccentric load. It's just push, 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 push. Uh, so if we can get those guys just in and, and you know what, and, uh, every guy that's came to me, I told him like, I don't want you to get off the bike. I don't want you to stop doing triathlons. I'm not going to tell you to not run 50 mile races. I want you to do that. That's your expression. That's your athleticism. That's what you're trying to do to compete. And I'm not taking you from that. I'm not telling you it's wrong, but allow me to, to develop this stuff on the other side that I believe will pay dividends here. Cause I believe a stronger athlete is a healthier athlete, uh, a more durable athlete. 
and just basically all things being equal, a better athlete. Strength is the platform at which everything is built. That if I could impart one thing to people is be strong. Uh, nobody ever, I mean, uh, I've never met anybody that, ah, that guy's too strong. It's kind of like that car was way too fast. That girl was way too good looking. That guy had way too much money in his pocket. That, you know, you know what, that meal was, way, that steak was amazing. That was, I should have never had that. You know, like nobody ever says that shit. Like being strong, um, you know, and being able to just do some basic barbell movements and, and couple it with your training. Like even the MMA guys we've trained, just basically allow them to do, you know, their jiu-jitsu, their stand-up, their boxing, all the different modalities, and then put them in a basic barbell type thing and allow them to develop capacity uh, in what they're training for. Um, for you guys especially, like if you got to run long, you better run long. If you got to fight and you know you're going to tussle with a dude, you better be skilled with your hands. And you better be strong. And more importantly, you better be doing things that allow you to be healthy because you might have to sit on your ass for a car for fucking five or six hours, which will kill your back. And, um, you know, what does the training look like to allow you to get out of the car and not hurt yourself? So that's what I think about. John Wellborn, Power Athlete HQ. Where can people find out more about you and your programs? Yeah, like you said, you can find us at Power Athlete HQ. That's the URL. Um, if you put John Wellborn into Google, you can find me pretty easy. I got social media uh, in every media, and it's usually all John Wellborn. So you can find me a power athlete. And uh, also, uh, um, you know, you can go to the CrossFit football site, which uh, is going through a little bit of a, a metamorphosis as we speak. So uh, keep your eyes peeled on that and what we have, some new stuff coming out here pretty soon. And I'll put all of those links into the show notes for everybody. So you can go to the squadroom.net uh, forward slash episode uh, 45 for the notes on this so you can find and track down John if you want to join Power Athlete HQ or want to reach out to him uh, or just follow some of the stuff he does. You post some really good stuff on the socials too, so people should follow you there for sure. John, thanks for your time. Appreciate everything uh, you've done for law enforcement and uh, you know, just uh, appreciate you taking the time today just to uh, to help share some of this knowledge. It's been, it's been great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you much for having me. Appreciate it. All right, John Wellborn, uh, check our show notes to get all the information on how to follow him on all the social medias, the Power Athlete HQ. Again, you go to powerathletehq.com in the store. He's offering uh, 20% off of his uh, book, Talk to Me, Johnny. It's an ebook. You can get it there. Uh, And you'll check the show notes here at thesquadroom.net forward slash episode 45 for more information on the things that we talked about there in the show, some of his quotes the connections to his social media and all that. If you want to follow us on Instagram, it's at the squad room and also on Twitter at the same email me at Garrett at the squad net. If you have a comment or question, and if you're not subscribed to our mailing list, you need to do that. If you're on your phone right now, all you have to do is text the squad room, all one word to four, four, two, 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 and you get signed up from the palm of your hand. Otherwise you can go to your desktop, go to our squad, the squad room.net and you can, it'll pop up and you can sign up right there and you get access to some interesting and good information. All right. Uh, until next time, please take care of each other and stay safe. And lastly, remember audibletrialcom forward slash the squad room for a free 30 day trial and a free ebook. If you're out and about and you need to, uh, expand your mind and, uh, and, and read quote unquote, read, i.e. listen to a book, audibletrial.com forward slash the squad room. Thanks for listening, everybody. The show is a lot of fun because I hear from you and I hear what you're going through and I hear, and I get connections from all over the world. Uh, that's a huge part of the reason I keep doing it. This is just a hobby. I mean, audible is, yes, it's sponsoring it, but uh, my hope is that it's enough to help pay for some of the just basic stuff that goes on. The fun part of this is uh, talking to you and interacting with you guys and knowing that, my ability to have a conversation with John Wellborn or Freddie Camacho or um, uh, Kirk Parsley or any of the other guests that we've had on, that those things benefit you and that you get something from it. I love hearing that. So please keep me posted, Garrett at thesquadroom.net or hit me up on Instagram. All right, everybody, take care of each other and stay safe.